Good evening. My name is Robert Lieberman. I'm the Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs. Um, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the um, annual uh, George W. Ball Lecture, uh, which is associated with the uh, George W. Ball Adjunct Professorship, which is a reasonably new uh, institution um, here at SEPA. Uh, the, the George Ball uh, Adjunct Professorship was endowed a few years ago by an anonymous donor um, in honor of George W. Ball who served as, um, as part of a long and distinguished career in, uh, in American foreign affairs um, as an undersecretary of state in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations and as US ambassador to the United Nations later in the 1960s. Um, ambassador Ball's principled and far-sighted dissents from Cold War orthodoxies, especially during the early stages of America's involvement in Vietnam, established him as an exemplar of reasoned um, but serious opposition uh, during an era when conformity was often valued uh, more highly than clear-headed analysis. Um, and the, the George Ball professorship was created, as I said, a number of years ago to um, recognize and honor the contributions of George Ball um, as an important diplomatic figure um, who thought about American foreign policy um, and the United States in the world um, in a way that didn't conform to the pieties and orthodoxies uh, of his time. The professorship um, supports the appointment of an adjunct faculty member every year who has demonstrated a record of thoughtful and innovative contributions to international understanding and a proven ability to apply these qualities teaching here at SEPA. Um, and this past spring, we were extraordinarily honored and very lucky to have with us as the George W. Ball uh, professor, Leslie Gelb, who I think um, as much as anyone working in the field of uh, American foreign policy and international affairs today embodies these qualities of, uh, 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 that we honor in the George Ball professorship, clear-headed analysis, um, refusal to conform uh, for conformity's sake to the orthodoxies of his time. Um, and, and Les has demonstrated that, uh, those qualities over an extraordinarily long, uh, distinguished career um, in a variety of ways in, the, in, in American foreign policy. I, I like to say often that my job um, as dean, the, the main part of my job description as dean is introducing people who need no introduction. Um, and tonight is really one of the nights when that's, uh, that's true. Nevertheless, um, let me just mention a few highlights of uh, Les's career, um, which spans an incredible range, a just breathtaking range of, uh, of jobs, um, at all of which he's excelled, from academia to journalism to foreign policy scholarship and analysis. He uh, began his career as an academic um, in the government department at uh, Wesleyan University. Um, worked uh, for uh, U.S. Senator from New York, Jacob Javits, in 1966 and 1967. Was Director of Policy Planning and Arms Control uh, for International Security Affairs at the Department of Defense in the late 1960s, um, where he uh, served as Director of the Pentagon Papers Project. Um, uh, was a Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. Um, served uh, in the Carter administration as an assistant secretary of state um, and spent uh, intermittently at various times um, in between uh, these other jobs um, as a, a, a correspondent and columnist and editor um, uh, at the New York Times um, where he won a Pulitzer Prize for explanatory journalism in 1985. Um, most more recently he um, uh, uh, served as the president and now president emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations, where he took what had been a longstanding um, prominent institution and really made it into one of the preeminent centers of scholarship and analysis and, and clear-headed um, and often unorthodox analysis of uh, foreign and international affairs um, in the United States and indeed in the world. Um, so less over the course of a varied um, um, and distinguished career has made innumerable 
contributions to our understanding and our practice of, uh, of, of international security and foreign policy. It was a real treat to have him here teaching our students uh, at SEPA in the spring as the George W. Ball professor. And it's my real uh, privilege to introduce him tonight as the George Ball lecturer. So, uh, Les. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> you guys are really very lucky in your deans. You've had terrific deans at this place. You also have terrific professors, two of whom, sitting in the front, I assume, have mandated your attendance here <laughs> in the face of a vice presidential debate and more importantly, a Yankees playoff game. Uh, <clears throat> my wife criticizes me for meandering too much before I start a uh, speech, so let me meander. I can't resist it. Uh, <clears throat> my mother used to hate for me to be introduced. Uh, your dean left out half my jobs, and she thought my curriculum vitae proved that I couldn't hold a job. <laughs> and uh, when I left the New York Times, I left the foreign affairs column at the New York Times to become president of the council, I called my mother who was uh, in, just hit her 90s and she was at a nursing home. And I said, Mom, you know, I'm going to leave the column at the New York Times to become president of the council on foreign relations. She says, what's that? And I explained it to her. And she says, if you do this, People here are going to think you're dead. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> I knew George Ball. And I'm no George Ball. George Ball was amazing. Uh, I didn't realize there was a lectureship at, named in his honor here. But I knew him from the Vietnam days, and I knew him subsequently. And I've never seen a smarter guy, uh, a, a more powerful advocate than, than George Ball. And he got himself into enormous trouble because of his uh, ability to out-argue anybody on the block. <clears throat> he was of the senior people in the uh, Johnson administration, by far until Clark Clifford came along, the strongest advocate against the Vietnam War. And this tinged him for future service. There's no question about it. But he didn't care. He went ahead and argued his case. Historical footnote, just to show that we, even though we're there, we may not know anything, or maybe we do. Years later, I read LBJ's memoir, Vantage Point. And I'm looking through the Vietnam section. And all of a sudden, I come on this statement by LBJ that George Ball wasn't a Vietnam dissenter at all. He said he put Ball up to it, that he needed a dissenter to challenge all the people who wanted to do more in Vietnam. And Ball would back them off. Now, I, I, <clears throat> I asked Ball about this sometime later, and he said it was LBJ making up the truth, as he often did. Uh, but but you, don't, you just don't know. But George Ball was an extraordinary guy. Last point before I start uh, talking is I got hoodwinked into this lecture. I had no idea that this was part of my contract, and I defy Columbia, SEPA, to prove it to me. Here I was just about finishing up my seminar in how to make strategy when the, den, the, de, the den, then dean, John Coatsworth, called me up and said, oh, by the way, uh, part of your obligation is to give a lecture. It's called the George Ball Lecture. Anyway, here it is. And it's a, it's, I give it in that spirit. <laughs> Uh, I was trying to think of something that was in keeping with George Ball and in keeping with me. And so I came up with the title about how U.S. foreign policy usually gets screwed up. Uh, and I believe that very deeply. And I, I don't believe it on uh, ideological or political grounds. 
Uh, let me tell you two things before I uh, start rambling. One is I have no politics. Never been a Democrat or a Republican. I dislike them both intensely and would never join either of those political parties. And I can't imagine anyone forming a party that I would join. But I've never had politics. I dislike them both. I criticize them both. I take pleasure in attacking both. Uh, secondly, as you hear me out, you're going to hear criticisms mostly about how the right is beating up on the left, the conservatives on the liberals. And the reason I do that is not from ideology, because I regard myself as kind of a traditional realist in the Henry Kissinger school, and that's more or less how I come at things. I look at a problem, talk about US interests, think about US interests, and what power we have to affect them. It's always been my outlook on these things. But in American politics, the liberals and the left barely exist. That's a reality. There's, only, there's been only one time since the end of World War II where liberals and the left really were influential. And that was a brief period toward the end of the Vietnam War. But otherwise, they just don't count. They're not a counterweight. And uh, even Democratic presidents, except for LBJ in the Vietnam War, don't worry much about what liberals have to say. They don't care. Uh, as far as they're concerned, liberals on foreign policy don't exist. So I'm going to talk about all the ridiculous things that go on in US foreign policy now just to show that the historical analysis I'm going to give you isn't just historical. Uh, and then I'll talk about some of the good things US foreign policy did. Uh, because I think it's very important to understand that it's just not a litany of stupid and irreversible mistakes. We did a lot of good things. Then I'm going to talk about some of the bad things, particularly the wars, and then talk about the reasons behind all this. And it will be short because I want to get home to the Yankees game. So look at Iran. Now, I don't want Iran to, to have nuclear weapons. Uh, in fact, I don't want Pakistan to have nuclear weapons, or India, or North Korea, whatever. And here we are, whether you realize it or not, rhetorically boxing ourselves in to go to war with Iran. The so-called wimp president, uh, Barack Obama, has said he is not going to follow a policy of containment toward Iran. He's not going to rely simply on deterrence. And uh, once Iran shows that it's about to have a nuclear capability, he's going to take military action. It's hard to read his words any other way. <clears throat> and no one says boo about it. Hear this threat to go to war with Iran. Now, did we do the same thing to North Korea? I mean, if you want to think of a bunch of crazies, I picked North Korea. Did we say we're going to go to war with them if they uh, exploded a nuclear uh, bomb or developed a nuclear capability? I don't think so. Did we do it with the even more insane Pakistanis? If I had to pick any country in the world that I regard as insane, and I would pick Pakistan. If I think of any country that has done real damage to the United States already, I'd pick Pakistan because of the nuclear secrets and material they sold to other countries and perhaps even to terrorist groups we don't know because the guy in charge of that program, A.Q. Khan, is free 
and the PACs won't let us interrogate him. These are lovely allies, and we didn't go to war with them. Israel has nuclear weapons. India ha has nuclear weapons. What, what's so special about Iran? What's special about Iran is the argument that they're nuts. These other ones weren't nuts, but Iran is nuts. You can't rely on deterring them. They're, more, they're likely to use nuclear weapons. Now, mind you, I heard all this stuff during the Cold War. There wasn't a day in my career that I didn't waste arguing with people who said, the Soviet Union is crazy, the Chinese are crazy, these are communists, they don't care if they lose half their population, they'll launch nuclear war. Now that idea was nuts then, I believe it's nuts now. <clears throat> but we've gotten ourselves into this uh, mindset that Iran is somehow different from all these others. In part, it has to do with Israel. But it also, it's how we talk ourselves into stuff. Take, take Syria. We're moving along the path, despite good foot dragging by the Obama administration, we're moving along the path to get more and more involved there, including providing uh, more arms than we're already providing. We're helping to provide. Now, what's the sense in that? Is it because people are dying? There are a whole bunch of Syrians dying, so we've got to go in there? Is dying the criteria? Is that what's driving us? Not a chance. There are many more people who are dying in the Sudan, or in Rwanda, or in lots of places in Africa. I didn't hear people saying we ought to have uh, uh, no fly zones over Mali, now that the crazies have taken over the northern part of Mali. They didn't say that. Why, why Syria? Uh, and do, e do we even know who we'd be giving the arms to there? We don't. There are about 50 to 100 different rebel groups. And if you know anything about the United States, you would know that our CIA people don't have any idea who these people are. They don't know. They're all, to Americans, a bunch of ragheads. They can't begin to distinguish between the good rebels and the jihadi extremist rebels. <clears throat> and what if we do get rid of Assad? What happens to that country? What if we really weigh in and get rid of this guy? Does it mean that the killing will stop? Or does it mean that uh, a Sunni majority in that country controlled by these extremists will kill even more? They'll kill the Alawis this time. And yet we're marching toward this. With Russia, the Russians are about to bow out of a very important agreement that we made with them some time ago to help them collect their fissile material and their chemical weapons. <clears throat> and they're not very good at it, and they needed our help, and they knew they did. And they're about to back out from it for a bunch of reasons, but including the fact that we continued to build missile defense uh, systems in Eastern Europe. Now, you will say, what's wrong with building these uh, missile defense systems in Eastern Europe? We're, we're protecting the Eastern Europeans and the Western Europeans. From what? Well, if you ask uh, the, the uh, people directly involved in this, they say it would be against an Iranian attack. You know, give me a break. How stupid can our business be? Do we think that the Iranians are going to attack uh, uh, the Czech Republic, France? And yet we have these serious presentations by our government to that effect. Uh, now, the Soviets think that this missile system is just the first step in a missile defense system against them. But they're crazy too, you know? 
I mean, I said Soviets. That just shows my age. The Russians. The Russians think it's directed against them. Uh, that's nonsense. The Russians can easily overcome anything we could conceivably build there by way of missile defense systems. It's not even close. But you see, they're crazy too. They're big powers. Big powers are particularly crazy because they have power. The little ones who haven't got any power are less crazy. <clears throat> so they're about to drop a program that's in their interest because of this nonsense about the missile defense system in Europe. And we're not about to stop uh, these deployments ourselves. Billions upon billions of dollars for nothing, save the fact that if we stop doing it, then uh, 1,700 poles in Ohio and three checks in Pennsylvania will protest to the White House. Well, you're not defending uh, my parents' homeland. You know, just, it's total nonsense. And yet, that's what's driving it. It isn't that anyone seriously believes you can defend against the Russian missile attack or that Iran will attack Europe. And yet, on we march. <coughs> on we march. We have a country where, over the last 20 years, we cared so little about our economy that we allowed ourselves to go into debt to China to almost a trillion and a half dollars. Mostly are buying their stuff and they're financing it. We're borrowing from them to pay for our consumption. Is no one staring at the fact that when you do this, what you're doing is advertising to the world the weakness of the American economy. This is how we have to uh, to relate to countries like China in order to survive economically. We have to go into debt to them to a trillion and a half dollars. Nobody had the discipline to deal with it. No one had the sense to stand up and say, this is perhaps the single most dangerous thing for the United States of America. Because security in the 21st century is at least as much about economics as it is about military. The principal coin of the international realm today is more economics than anything else. That's what, how most power is exercised today. It's not because countries think we're now going to invade them. They don't. It's what we can, can do for them economically or can't do for them economically. And is the president standing up, either President Bush or President Obama, and explaining this to the American people? That the state of our economy is a matter of national security. National security, our survival, our power in the world. It's not as if it never happened, it did happen. President Eisenhower faced a situation where he was under great pressure to spend more and more on uh, defense. You remember after World War II, we had virtually dismantled our, our military punch. Built it up under Korea, but it was still relatively small compared to what it had been. And the, so and the Soviets were building and building. Eisenhower was under great pressure to spend more on defense himself. What did he do? He said, you know, the Soviets are building and building and building. This is a matter of national security. What we need to build is highways throughout the United States of America so that we can move our arms from one end of the continent to the other. And that's how we built our national highways. Eisenhower leveraged the uh, Russian military buildup into a highway program. Then 
1957, Russians launched Sputnik, and again, the country went nuts. We're exposed. The Soviets can now conquer us. And Eisenhower said, yes, we're exposed. The Soviets could conquer us. What we need to do is increase our abilities in math and science. And he started the first major federal program to support education in math and science. He said this was national security. And it's national security today. Every once in a while, the president makes noises in that direction. But this is sort of fundamental. Not doing it is crazy. It's crazy. It's irresponsible. Now, I've told you all these, or I tell you some of these ridiculous things that we're doing now. They make really no sense. It's not as if we were always that way. This country did amazing things. You go back to the Truman administration, and the Truman administration put in place international institutions that were so critical, so viable, so essential to the functioning of any international order that they all exist today. Every one of them were in one form or another. The general agreements on tariffs and trade, all the free trade negotiations, the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, NATO, and more. All the foreign aid programs, to the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was the basis of a united Europe today because it forced the Europeans to cooperate then in order to receive our aid. Incredible. It never happened before that international institutions were either created or could last that long. But these made sense. They were the work of practical genius, really what America should be about. <clears throat> we did good in the Korean War. It was very important when North Korea attacked South Korea that it not be allowed to get away with it because it could have sent a fundamental signal of weakness to the Soviets and to the Chinese. An attack like that. And we fought that war. It was the right decision. It was a very tough decision. Uh, the US military had had a doctrine of not fighting any Asian land wars. So when Truman decided to do it, it was courageous. Eisenhower was courageous and right and did something very smart in reversing the attack on the Suez Canal by England, France, and Israel. England, England and France at that point were great close allies of the United States. But what they were doing was an act of sort of 18th and 19th century colonialism. They were going to control the Suez Canal. They were going to control Egypt. Eisenhower told them, get out, or I'm going to destroy your, your, your economies. It was an act of great courage and served America well in terms of positioning our country in what was emerging now as a whole new part of our world, the third world. Uh, rather than re rehearse a, a lot of this, there, there were also uh, regimes striving to become free that were under pressure from communists supported by the Soviet Union, and we helped them. And uh, that was a very important part of the Cold War history as well. When it came many years later to Bosnia, we did a very courageous thing. After fighting with ourselves for several years, uh, we provided arms to the Muslims and to the Croats to defend themselves. And then we gave them air cover, and the war came to an end. It's a good, tough decision. Now, there are dozens of examples of these, and important to keep in your head as you hear from me or anybody else about the uh, evil United States. It's compared to any other 
major power in history, we're good. But boy, did we make a lot of mistakes. <clears throat> Let me focus on just three of them, the wars. One was the Vietnam War. Now, I raise that because that's still the dominant influence in my life, in my thinking, that war. It was an important part of shaping what was in my head. Now, I was, coming from the background I had, I was a typical Cold Warrior. I was in favor of the Vietnam War. Uh, when uh, I was teaching, or when campuses asked me to come speak, it was to defend the war, and I did. And I defended it because of the domino theory. Now, the domino theory made perfect sense to me. It was based on the experience of World War II. Hitler and Japan uh, went after smaller countries first, and nothing was done about it by the international community, so they went after bigger ones, and we had the World War. So the world fell like dominoes because we didn't stand up in the beginning. The logic of it made perfect sense. Only, it didn't really hold in Vietnam. And we knew it, and we knew it. When I got into the Pentagon, uh, I also got stuck with a second job running the Pentagon Papers Project, uh, which was a nightmare to do. But the CIA sent over a whole bunch of stuff, including all their national intelligence estimates from the 1950s, 1960s too, but the 1950s. And I had this colonel as my, my deputy who read everything. He was a fan fanatic. He read everything. And he came to me with these national intelligence estimates. That is, the judgments based on intelligence of the CIA. And here's what these NIEs, as they were called, said. They said there was a split between the Soviet Union and China, flat out. Didn't say, oh, they were having troubles and arguing about this. They said there was a split. And it showed hard evidence to back it up. Secondly, the NIE showed that there was a split between China and North Vietnam, that they hated each other, fought many wars over history. There it all was. I said, my God, what dominoes? What communist conspiracy was going to take us out in Vietnam and then Indochina and then in Asia and then the rest of the world? Right there it said the basis of the domino theory didn't exist. Now, do you think anybody in the US government paid any attention to that? Not a chance. Not a chance. <clears throat> but we didn't know anything about Vietnam. On top of it, on top of all that, we didn't know anything about Vietnam. There was sort of one book in English that some people who were making Vietnam policy had read, Bernard Falls, The Two Vietnams. That was it. Otherwise, Vietnam was a square on the strategic chessboard. That's all it was. A square on the strategic chessboard because we were in this great power strategic game. And we didn't know it was peopled by Tonkinese, Cochin Chinese and a hundred other tribes. We didn't know the conflicts uh, between Vietnam and China. It was all Greek to the people who were taking us to war. All Greek to them. <clears throat> and it's typical. When you go to uh, meetings at the NSC, you will see that it is, uh, with the top policymakers, an NSC meeting, you will see that the country or regional experts who might know something about the country are never there. Never there, never. Even when you meet with the secretaries, 
The country experts are, ra are rarely there. They're not their people. They want their people in their office to have a private conversation, to say things they don't want anyone else to hear. So they don't get to know much about the country they're dealing with. It's all squares on a, on a chessboard. And then when you get involved, it's almost impossible to extricate yourself. When you figure out that what the Joint Chiefs of Staff said to the President in the 1950s was true, it was too late to act on it. What they said to, to Eisenhower in 1956 was, and I quote in a formal paper to the President, Indochina, which is where Vietnam was, Indochina is devoid of strategic interest to the United States. The place where we were fighting all those years, devoid of strategic interest to the United States. But we were in it. And as L LBJ said in a telephone call that became public uh, when his tapes became public about 15 years ago, as he said in a private telephone conversation to Senator Richard Russell, he said, Dick, I can't win and I can't get out. I don't know what to do. <clears throat> you know, most of you who didn't study Vietnam have no idea that we had 550,000 troops there. 550,000 troops for a place that was devoid of strategic interest to the United States, where there were no dominoes, and where not so long after, the president of the nation that defeated us there, Vietnam, came to have lunch with, what was the name of that president? George W. Bush. This enemy that we couldn't possibly negotiate with would be our mortal foe forever. The president of that country came to have lunch with George W. Bush. And today, if you've noticed, uh, we're, we're edging closer and closer to becoming an ally of Vietnam. And then Iraq. Why do we have an Iraq war? Where the hell did that come from? Now, I supported that war because I was told Saddam was on the edge of having nuclear weapons. And I thought if we conducted a limited military operation, which I won't bore you with unless you want to ask me about it later, got a brilliant idea, I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> My idea of how to fight that war was this. <clears throat> we couldn't go fight a war, try to uh, occupy the whole country. We already were in control of the northern part of Iraq, Kurdistan. We had been since the first uh, uh, Iraq war, by the way, which was a good war. Iraq invaded Kuwait. We kicked them out. So we had been protecting Kurdistan since that war 10 years before. My idea, and, and, and uh, Bush declined at that time to offer any arms and protection to the Shiite Iraqis in the south. My idea was let's offer that air cover and, and armaments to the Shiites in the south, the same way we were doing it with the Kurds in the north, and they would fight the same way the Kurds would fight for their independence. And that would allow us to control the north of Iraq and the south of Iraq and 95% of the oil. Saddam would be gone by his own people. We wouldn't have to have an Iraq-wide war for years. But uh, that plan wasn't entertained by anyone except Paul Wolfowitz. He actually proposed something similar to Rumsfeld. The Pentagon had no plan for fighting the war at all. Here we were going into a war where we, where we would fight for 10 years and there was no plan. I'd just go in there and get rid of Saddam. You know, 
uh, in Bush's first year, when I was already ensconced at the Council on Foreign Relations, I had a visit from a U.S. senator who just came back from Europe. And I was asking him questions about Europe. And he says, Les, you're asking me about all the wrong stuff. You should be asking me about Iraq. I said, what are you talking about? Remember when Bush came in, Russia was the big enemy. That's what they were going to focus on. He says, you're asking me the wrong thing. You're going to ask me about Iraq. I said, well, what about Iraq? He says, we're going to invade it. This senator was very close personal friends with George W. Bush. Met with him privately all the time, had dinners with him and so forth. He said, George Bush is going to invade Iraq. And I said, you're kidding me. And he said, no, he's going to do it. This is long before the nuclear stuff started to be promoted. No, he's going to do it because he thought the biggest mistake his father had made in office was not to finish off Saddam, and he was going to make up for it. I said, that's no reason to go to war. He said, he's going. He's determined. <clears throat> and then here, Obama finally takes us out of Iraq, and a whole bunch of people start complaining that we got out of Iraq. Why don't we keep 15,000 troops there? That would have stopped the Civil War. Be reasonable for once. How would that 15,000 people who are just going to be trainers and intelligence stop what's going on in Iraq today? Then there's Afghanistan. We had every good reason to go after Afghanistan because the Taliban government there hosted an attack on the United States. We had to go punish them. And I was all in favor of that. The notion that we would go to uh, Afghanistan and stay there for all these years to get rid of any possible threat from that country by turning it through counterinsurgency warfare into a stable democracy was something, as my father used to say, only Americans could believe. It was crazy. It's still crazy. Uh, we even realized it was crazy, and so stopped talking about Afghanistan so much and said we have to win in Afghanistan in order to promote stability in Pakistan. And you had to be an idiot to believe that any outcome in Afghanistan was going to sway what was going to happen in this much larger, tumultuous uh, neighboring country of Pakistan. Just <laughs> bizarre. Uh, <clears throat> it's hard to argue we have anything resembling vital interest in Afghanistan today. The terrorist threat that was once centered there has now morphed and become worldwide. But we're there. And even though the combat troops will come out very quickly after the election, there still will be a very large American presence there for reasons we pretend are important. Now, what the hell is causing all this? Well, you know, one thing, if you ever served in government or will, you have to realize there's no time to do anything sensible. It, it is incredible what a senior official has to go through every day. The pressures. You receive or make somewhere between 25 and 50 telephone calls. You're an assistant secretary on up. You're going to meetings all day long, 10, 12 meetings. You have an inbox piled like this. And the whole routine of clearing that inbox, going to meetings, eats you alive. So you don't think about these things, which means you don't develop a strategy. Strategy is absolutely essential. It's the only way you avoid this daily crisis that officials go through. Sitting down at the beginning, however long it's going to take, and thinking your way through what you know and what you don't know about the problem with the country. In a very hard-headed way. How can we find out what we don't know? Can we find out what we don't know? Exactly what are our interests? Exactly. What are achievable objectives? Not what we'd like, but what we can actually achieve. And what power do we have to make it all happen? 
working it all through, sequencing it. It is a very disciplined, difficult process, and we just don't do it. In rare exceptions, Truman people did it, Nixon and Kissinger did it in the waning days of the Vietnam War, where they thought of a, a brilliant strategy to cloak our defeat there, opening to China, triangular diplomacy with China and the Soviet Union, and the Middle East uh, peace process. They demonstrated American diplomatic power. And then George H.W. Bush demonstrated a strategy in the closing days of the Cold War by ending the Cold War without a hot war. It was a tremendous accomplishment. And the key to their strategy was helping Soviet leader Gorbachev dismantle his own empire. Even though there were people here in the United States, I won't name them. Some of them could even be teaching at Columbia who were against this. Say, oh, Gorbachev is just a communist conspiring to get us to help them. But they had that strategy and it worked. We did nothing to stand in his way of dismantling his own empire. So we can do strategy, but we hardly ever do it. And it's usually the result of a few people figuring it out, taking the time, figuring it out, explaining it to their subordinates so that they can do it. Then behind all this, of course, is ideology. Americans have a very powerful ideology about making the world better for democracy. Something some of our most realistic presidents called a very dangerous trait on our part. You know, it's America, when we do good, we really can do good like no one else. But when we try to do too much good, we get into trouble. We've helped democratize countries. And it's interesting when you look where we've been most successful. It's been with military dictatorships where we had close relations. South Korea, Taiwan, Turkey, where we got them over time to allow the development of civil society and law, and where eventually their countries were ready to become democracies. We did it very well in those places. Where we tried to do it by war or by fiat, it never worked. So ideology stands in our way. The notion of American power stands in our way because we almost always end up exaggerating it. Now, one thing I can say on behalf of the Obama administration, and I've criticized lots of what they've done, is they do have an understanding of the limits of American power. And they've made less costly mistakes than administrations, most administrations for the last 40 years or so. Because they understand what we can do and what we can't do. When you get into government or when you're part of the when you're part of the foreign policy debate, you can do anything. We're masters of the universe. And finally, politics. A great democracy is, in our foreign policy, our undoing. So much of what happens in, in American foreign policy really is about politics. But it's never talked about inside except with your closest friends and advisors. It's never talked about at the NSC meeting, what pressure you're under, why you're going to do something, why Johnson said to Dick Russell, I can't win and I can't get out of Vietnam. That's not, there's no record of that ever being said at an NSC meeting. It wasn't. But it gets factored into everything that gets done. And almost always, not always, almost always in the direction that we can't fix our mistakes. We have to persist in them. But remember, we did more good than anyone else. And I never give up on us.
Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Les. Um, we have we a few minutes for questions. Not a lot, but a few. So um, if you'd like to ask a question, we have a microphone up here. So if you can um, so make your way up to the mic, and, um, and we'll call on a few people for, for questions before we have to break up. Did I go over time as usual? Absolutely not. Sir. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us. Um, I have a, uh, my name is Sean Ketch. I'm, I'm having trouble understanding you. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll speak up. Um, Stand away from the mic a little. Away from the mic. Okay. Is this good? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, kind of a sequential question. One, uh, as an ex-Cold Warrior who has kind of seen uh, changes in your own ideology personally, could you explain today what you think, one, uh, the biggest security threats are to the United States? And uh, secondly, can you talk about um, whether you think the U.S. power is in decline or is it not? And finally, uh, do you think that um, uh, the United States has a current containment policy and uh, how should it be thinking uh, about that? So I can remember at least two of those questions, <laughs> better than I usually do. Uh, what are the real threats to us? Terrorism, I think, is uh, uh, one of the two principal threats. Uh, the other is uh, cyber and what the terrorists can do, because you can't <clears throat> contain or deter them, or which are the two major elements of our national security policy. Uh, the other is uh, cy cyber warfare. Defense Secretary Panetta, I believe tonight, is uh, speaking at the aircraft carrier about cyber warfare. Uh, <clears throat> he is one of the few senior people in the administration to talk about it. But if you want to worry about our country being brought to its knees, our economy being brought to its knees, uh, cyber attacks represent the, the major threat. Now, what, what was the second question? Decline. decline. Well, oh, decline. decline, yeah. That's a good question. Foreign policy people argue about it all the time. See, I don't know why they argue about it. It's just obvious to me uh, that uh, relative to the power we had uh, in the previous 50 years, we don't have as much today. I don't see how you can argue about that. Uh, other powers are now much stronger than they used to be. They count more. The United States, because of our economy in the past, could get much more of its way than it can today. Remember, we couldn't push other countries around militarily. The Soviet Union was there as the other great power. Uh, but we had economic supremacy, which we don't have today. And our economy really is in trouble. You want to call it economic de decline when uh, our debt will soon equal the size of our GDP? I call that economic decline. Uh, but some people seem to get, uh, uh, have nervous breakdowns when you say that about the United States. I think it's very important to understand it for two reasons. One, the problems are so serious unless you acknowledge them you're not going to be able to fix them. We have to stop pretending, including the president. Uh, they're more serious than he says in his most candid moments. And, <clears throat> and uh, secondly, uh, it means we have to rethink how we lead in the world. Now, since we're not as potent relative to others as we used to be, we can't just say, follow me, leading from the front, as we were so often used to doing. Now, in many cases, we do have to lead from behind. Now, I stress two words in what I just said, lead and behind. We do lead. You don't have to lead from the front if people aren't going to follow you. You can lead from behind in the sense of getting others to accept more responsibility 
and to act in their interests. You know, if uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Qatar want to do more in Syria, uh, we can help organize that. If uh, we want to leave Afghanistan in a responsible way, we don't stay there forever. That's just a stupid policy when our interests don't justify it. But the key to our strategy ought to be to get the neighbors of Afghanistan who have real interests in combating terrorism, refugees, and drugs to step up to their responsibilities and to do more for the Afghans. Uh, that's why it's important to acknowledge that our relative power has declined. Other questions? I'll, I'll take uh, my privilege and ask a question. I was captivated by your description of politics um, in the United States as a barrier to sensible foreign policy often. But I wonder if you'd reflect on differences in American politics now compared with earlier times in your own career where we're now in a period of such extreme polarization. There's essentially no overlap between the two parties on yeah. anything, foreign policy or, any, or, or uh, otherwise. I wonder if, if that makes that problem different, more acute. How do you compare the current political moment yeah. uh, with, with earlier times? It, it's very hard to do. It really is. If certain periods of the last uh, 70 years, I know very, very well. Truman was under constant attack from uh, Democrats for domestic reasons, uh, Southern Democrats, and uh, from Republicans for being soft on communism. Here's this guy who did all the things I said. They were at him constantly for being soft on communism. And nothing could get done in Congress. There was absolute stalemate. For the 48 elections, uh, the Republicans hadn't passed any legislation that Truman had offered. It was like today. So Truman at the nominating convention got up and he gave a speech. He said, the Republicans say they want to pass this kind of legislation. I'm calling the US Congress back in the special legislation. And if they pass that legislation, I will sign it. The Republicans say they want to pass this kind of legislation. I'm calling Congress back in the session. If they pass that legislation, I will sign it. He did it for seven or eight different bills that they had made the centerpiece of what they were talking about in Congress and part of their party platform for the presidential election. And he called a special session of Congress. And the Republicans passed none of their bills. They had majorities in both houses. They passed none of their bills. Democrats didn't block them. They didn't pass them. Uh, Eisenhower uh, was under attack from the Republican Party uh, for not doing enough in foreign affairs. They wanted huge increases in defense spending and uh, by the Democrats on domestic issues. And there was very little legislation. With Kennedy, you remember, he couldn't pass any of the legislation he had been tinkering with. And it was only when he was assassinated, Johnson came in, that you had it. Uh, the guy who did the most to pass legislation in, with Democratic Congresses was Richard Nixon, by far. Uh, and uh, it's worth exploring why. But for most cases, I mean, Jimmy Carter was under constant attack, constant attack. I tell you a little story, uh, uh, illustrate what I was saying before in my talk. As soon as we went in, we were under attack. Even before we, we did many stupid things, which we were to do in short order, particularly regarding the Soviet Union. Uh, and I went to my boss, uh, the Secretary of State, Cy Vance. And I said, Cy, we're getting killed because our opponents are defining our policy for us. They're saying what our policy is. We need to say what our policy is. Now, the Secretary of State's office on the seventh floor looks out at the Lincoln Memorial and at the Memorial Bridge and the river. And Vance, the whole time I was talking, 
was twirling his reading glasses around like this and just looking out the window, not looking at me. And I went on and on about how we needed to define our own policy. Vance was a lifelong lawyer. And then finally he turned back to me, threw his glasses down on the table, and he said, the only time I ever heard him curse, he said, policy is bullshit. <laughs> Uh, they wouldn't have said that in the Truman administration. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, please. Okay, this is high. Uh, from a realist perspective, would you say that when the U.S. does good, it's in our best interest, or is it just the better angels of our nature? Yeah, I think it's in our interest. I think the, to the extent we can create a world where there's stable change and economic growth uh, and observation of basic freedoms, uh, we compete best. Uh, all, all our strengths go to that. But you know, our basic strength, the thing that I still vibrate to about our country is uh, less our ideals, although I'm glad we have them. I really am. I'm glad we care. Less, less those things than our practical, common sense approach to problems, which is, uh, for most of the world, quite unique. And we attracted people like that to our shores. And it was the hallmark of how this country developed because uh, our forebearers didn't let bullshit get in the way of solving problems. We have time maybe for one final question, if there is one. Can I say bullshit for the cameras there? <laughs> if not, um, I sure. think I'm glad we didn't end on the side man story. Uh, but I want to... <laughs> Uh, but I want to thank Les Gump for a really stimulating and penetrating lecture, and thank you all for, for coming. Thanks a lot. Thank